Good morning, Camden Catholic. Um, <clears throat> so it's about 7.30 in the morning, and mm, when I say I'm going to try and help you out with writing these DBQs, I really mean it, all right? So we are going to be kind of stair-stepping our way now into how the AP European History Exam grades their writing and talking about how to write properly using documents and things like that. So you ever heard of the phrase, baptism by fire? Well, <clears throat> that's kind of what I was getting at with the first DBQs. They were very leniently graded. Um, I was trying to kind of throw a lot of information at you at once. So when we actually got to the regular style DBQs, one day when y'all take my AP European class, that way you'll be able to crush them without thinking twice about it. So I've always been somebody who empirically learns from experience and especially when I make mistakes. So I'm very Lockean in that sense because we'll be talking about Hobbes and Locke this morning. All right, anyway, so quick recap before we get into those two big enlightenment thinkers. Um, Charles I is now dead, right? So, well, I mean, he's been dead for a long time. He would have died regardless. But uh, anyway, but Charles I is dead, and he's been beheaded by the Commonwealth. Uh, Oliver Cromwell is now under control, and even though he ends up becoming extremely conservative later on and, like, adopting, like, a military dictatorship, he does represent the liberal ideas of um, limitations of power and putting the government in the hands of the people by actually setting up a, par a republic-style government in England. Sorry, I'm just a little chilly. Um, anyway, so Cromwell supports the limited power government. The Cavaliers supports the absolutists. All right, so anyway, now let's get into our two big conflicting idea guys. So the first one is Thomas Hobbes. Now, Thomas Hobbes was born in 1588, and he died in, I believe, 1673. Um, and he believes that in nature, <clears throat> people are disgusting. He believes that in nature, people are cruel, greedy, selfish, and that they are going to fight, rob, and oppress one another and do whatever they have to do to gain an upper advantage. So, he believes that to get away from all this stuff, people willingly go into this thing called the social contract, much like... Um, pack animals almost, uh, that they give up their freedom in return for safety in an ordered, organized society. Like, you, this underlining ordered, organized society in the social contract is a great perspective to use when you're writing this DBQ. Now, therefore, Hobbes believes that a powerful government, like an absolute monarchy, is best for society. He believes that it's going to impose order, and then he's going to compel obedience, right? And this also suppresses rebellions. So, Hobbes believes that He's very Machiavellian. He believes that rulers should be feared so that safety is kept because people won't act out if they fear the consequences. So he actually set the foundation for the Enlightenment with this idea of the social contract, right? And that is Thomas Hobbes right there, looking like a super nice fella. I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the hair, but, you know, what are you going to do? So anyway... <clears throat> his most famous work is called the Leviathan. Now, if any of you know what a Leviathan is, a Leviathan is like a large monster. So um, he's talking about like the monster of human society. So Hobbes has been used to justify absolute power in government. His views on human nature are negative, or very pessimistic. He believes that life without laws is going to lead to solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short-lived lives. Hmm. He's a weird guy. I've never been a fan. Um, anyway, I think he's great. Like, I think he's very interesting to study just because he's so out there, but so odd at the same time. Um, anyway, so really quickly, who do you think Hobbes would support in the English Civil War? Waiting. Good job, Caitlin Dellas. All right, so. Uh, yeah, he would support uh, Charles and the Cavaliers, right? Because he believes that the only way to keep society ordered is to support these large absolutists, right? He would support Charles in probably almost anything he did, saying that, oh, well, he put the Duke of Buckingham in charge because he is in charge of patronage, and that's why he's in charge, not because he, like, favors him. Oh, you know, he's upset because you beheaded one of his uh, leaders of his cabinet. No, 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 no. So Hobbes supported the Cavaliers. Now, these are some of his greatest quotes that I've all came across, um, and unfortunately that one's cut off, but uh, anyway, so he said that, there we go, all right, let's go a little like that, and there we go. 
So he said a man's conscience and his judgment is the, is the same thing. And as the judgment, so also the conscience must be erroneous. Now, erroneous means like outlandish, ridiculous, unfair. He said curiosity is the lust of the mind. And that also in the state of nature, profit is the measure of right. <clears throat> now, if you want to go ahead and we read these quotes right here, these can be in integrated into your DBQ should you like to. So, leisure is the mother of philosophy. Now, this guy I like a lot. This guy is literally, ironically enough, even though... So I do beat on the Puritans a lot. I beat them up and I say that they are like just huge jerks and stuff like that. The reason why they were considered so liberal at the time, aside from the fact that they were against a lot of things that were considered f what we would call fun in society, they were against a lot of things like absolute power from one leader distracting from God, um, no limitations on government, um, impending on people's natural rights. Uh, they do believe in freedom of speech. That's why they were so boastful in their society. They did do some messed up stuff, but they honestly modeled a lot of things that we use in our American government. Now, John Locke is one of them, and I actually really like Locke a lot. He believes in a thing called natural rights, all right, or natural laws. The big word that you could use for him is inalienable, I-N-A-I, oh, excuse me, I-N-A-L-I-E-N-A-B-L-E, -E, inalienable, as in ones that cannot be stripped from you, right? So anyway, he believes that when you are born, the mind is a blank slate. A tabula rasa. Now, everything we know comes from experience. This is actually an idea called empiricism. I'm a big-time empirical learner. I have to learn from doing, right? I cannot just sit down and, like, that's why I give you the DBQs the way I do because, like, I have to learn by doing. I can't, like, have somebody just sit there and explain it to me. I've never been able to, like, even as a lacrosse player, I've never been able to, like, have someone just draw it up and say, now go out there and do it. I have to walk through it. I got to touch it. I got to feel like I see what's going on. So, <clears throat> Anyway, ugh, something on my screen. Uh, so, he believes that we learn empirically and that we react to the stimulus that the society gives us. So, in that sense... Sorry, there's something. All right, we're good. Now, in that sense, he believes that all of our rights are a part of nature and that our very existence comes from God. Now, he believes at birth, you are giving three main rights. And these are going to sound vaguely familiar. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of... Ooh, nope. I heard you over there, Cassandra, saying pursuit of happiness. Got all excited. No, not pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of property. He believes that every man should have the right to own, or like, not necessarily women because he is a Puritan, but still, we're not going to like judge him too harshly. But anyway, um, the pursuit of property was his main goal. And then actually that phrase in his two treatises on, treatises on government is going to directly inspire jo Thomas Jefferson when he writes the Declaration of Independence. So, and he also was raised by Puritans. This right here is John Locke. And as you can tell, the simple, the simple outfit, no buttons, uh, black and white, right? So anyway, now, his most famous two works are his two treatises on government. He believes that rulers and governments have an obligation, a responsibility to protect the natural rights of the people it governs. His natural rights include things like life, liberty, yes, but underneath that umbrella you go freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of political views, freedom of protest, freedom of that, you know, like he, that he believes that everyone has a right to good life good li and up among liberty is all those freedoms. Voltaire is a guy we'll talk about later who's going to take those freedoms and take them much further. But you'll see what we're doing when we get there. Now, he believes that if a government fails in its obligation to protect natural law and rights, that the people have the right to overthrow that government, right? Hence why he supports the roundheads. Now, anyway, this also, when you think about it, when you take his idea, he believes in the social contract too, just like Hobbes does. He just views it a different way, right? So anyway, the best government is one in which... Um, law is accepted by all, and the, every law is a limited power, right? He think he, Locke liked the English law, monarchy as long as the laws were limited. He believed that Cromwell was necessary to be a transitional phase, showing that movement towards a better absolute, like a better idea of a monarch, right? A monarch that's at like a monarch that's up here who can only do certain things, a parliament that's over here who can only do certain things. And can you see how the three branch government system that we adopted in our country is coming to fruition? 
yeah, like these guys literally are responsible for making the United States government what it is today. So the Enlightenment is actually very, very fascinating, even though it's kind of dull to study when you're a 15-year-old in high school. So anyway, now, Locke's ideas influenced Thomas Jefferson most directly, more than anything else, when the Jefferson wrote the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Locke justified the revolution in the eyes of the Founding Fathers, and he also influenced later revolutions in France. One little snippet up underneath, which you can put, is that he supported the Roundheads. He supported Cromwell, right? So one thing that's going to blow your mind before we even get there, most DBQs should be answered in five paragraphs. This one that we're going to do today only needs to be answered in four. And I'll show you when you get there. Don't freak out. Don't freak out. All right? So calm down. It's fine. Now, he believes that no man's knowledge here can go beyond his experience. All right? That's the empiricism aspect. He believes that all mankind being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or his possessions. Right? Um, I have always thought the actions of men to be the best interpreters of their thoughts. So... And the reason why men enter into society is the preservation of their property. So he believes that you are born with your natural rights, life, liberty, property, right? So